Oh, hey, how's it going? Good morning. So I'm John, this is Rohini. This talk is more about uh, the work that we've done over the last year and a half and building a security program. So let's talk about it. Next slide. There you go. All right, so I'm going to focus on our app security program, how we built it. It basically didn't exist. And then how, we, um, how it fits into the bigger picture, right? So we work at a company called Dun & Bradstreet, which most of you may know. It's a very large company. Uh, it's 175 years old, which is pretty old for a company. And um, when I joined Dun & Bradstreet, I was brought in to uh, help change kind of technology and security. And one of the big challenges is the way that people work there. They're like, you know, this is the way we've always done it, right? The status quo. So when I'm telling them you can't do this or you can't do this, sometimes uh, it's very interesting to see their reaction. People don't like change, right? So the team was not very technical. We outsourced a lot of the security activities. I'm a very technical person, so is Rohini. And we realized we wanted to build a tech team and we wanted to do more hands-on work. The company also has tons of meetings. I don't know why they, I, I think people just like to go to meetings and then when you ex invite them to a meeting, they show up. And it was and a big waste have, of time. And you have meetings about meetings. <laughs> meetings about meetings. So I also thought there was a lot of security theater. So people, you know, this is kind of like the ch compliance checkbox. So we wanted to, you know, stop that. And I saw activities, I just realized people didn't do it, right? So here's the scenario when I took this job. Right? We bought every tool you could imagine. Right? So there's like a lot of security budget, every tool you could pitch, like we bought. We had them all. We outsourced everything. No, none of them were set up right. And we just didn't really have a, a strong technical team. Does anyone here have a situation like that or been in one or know someone like that? You know someone like that. Yeah? A couple? You do? All right. All right. So. So it is a little familiar. I gave a similar talk recently, and people were like, yeah, that's exactly it. People don't like to admit it, though, right? It's like, we have the best security team. We do this, that. So we're going to talk about how we change the team and change the culture and what we did, right? So this is kind of what I was thinking, like, when I started, and I kind of started to learn what was happening. It's like, holy shit. Like, this is the current state. And I am like a tech guy, pen test, code review, like, testing. And then I realized, you know, like, things weren't weren't good, right? This is like maybe a year and a half, two years ago, right? So will you just stand up really quickly if you are a security consultant, you work for a company? <laughs> Matt Conda. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. You guys are like, maybe I'm consulting on the side a little, like some moonlighting. <laughs> All right, that's fine. What about, okay, will you stand up if you actually work like internally as a security person? All right, this is good. You guys are the people I'm talking to, the internal teams that have the struggle, right? Perfect. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about maturity, right, which is kind of the process of growing up the program and what that means. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the metrics, right? And uh, the focus is probably more on the maturity than really the metrics, but we will talk about some of the metrics we look at. I got an interesting debate with somebody yesterday about metrics and, like, how many metrics do you need? What do the metrics mean? I actually think less is more. And people are like, you can, spend, you can have a whole team of people looking at metrics. Who cares, right? So when I started, you know, it's like a couple months in. And I just really thought, like, OK, if you like clean slate, what would you do different? And somebody mentioned this to me. So I'm a secure, you know, security person internally. I'm assuming I'm always about to get fired, right? Like something bad is going to happen. I'm totally going to get fired. So I always think, like, OK, if I got fired today and then I came back tomorrow, how would I change the way it worked? Right? And so like, I basically asked all the people that on the team, like, OK, you're, you're all fired. Tomorrow you come back. Like, what would you do differently? Right? And it makes them really like, think outside the box. Like, how would you run things differently? So we started talking about that. Like, what are the ideas? What are things we would do? Right? And then you know, from my perspective, right, you've seen these talks about like, they're building this pipeline of app scanning and code and integration with developers and you know, RASP, whatever the latest it's thing is. Talk. It is our talk. <laughs> okay. But everyone's got like those things. They're, like we want to do it too, right? Like we want to be on the bleeding edge and have like cool security stuff and be amazing, right? So one of the things we did is we adopted Agile, um, which some people have talked about a little bit. But all of the security teams, all of the different groups now run kind of Agile in Agile manners, right? So Rohini will talk about that. 
And so this is kind of the story of what we've done and kind of where we are. And so one thing I would encourage, since some of you are working internally, some are consultants, um, this is my first internal security job, which is terrifying. Offense is way easier than defense, <laughs> sure right? And I'm like, oh man, I can't believe I took this defensive job. It's like a nightmare. <laughs> like you have to plug every hole, right? And then, uh, so I would love feedback from you, from anyone here on kind of as we go. So if you have a question, we don't have a mic, but you can just yell really loud um, about kind of your thoughts, your opinions, you disagree, you agree, what have you. All right, so I'll pass it over to Rohini here. Okay, great. So, um, actually, let me just push. So, you know, after this introduction, I get this team that really doesn't, you know, that did pretty much project management. Everything was outsourced. So, John brings me in and said, here you go. He, you know, make I this. Told her the state of <laughs> he did, to be she honest. Did. Yeah, he, he, I knew what I was getting into. So, the biggest thing was uh, we really needed to make this team technical, right? Like they were doing, they were project managing vendors and they'd never done a pen test before in their life, right? They didn't really know what a pen test was. They didn't know what a code review was. They didn't even really know what our applications were. Uh, but they were a smart team, right? They, they were good, they were smart, they wanted to learn. And, and that, was, that was amazing. So, Obviously, so the first thing I did was put them through a pen test, sort of an AppSec boot camp, right? So the first thing I told everyone was, we're gonna start pen testing. We've got like hundreds and possibly thousands of apps. We're gonna go for it. We're gonna pen test as much. We're gonna really understand our applications. And they really didn't even know Burp or SQL Map or Padbuster or you know, anything like that. So I, I, started, so I started with Burp, right? Number one tool, we had five, we got like a few licenses of Burp, uh, put them, showed them how to start running Burp and so on, running scans. And they'd come back to me, they're like, there's SQL injection. I was like, cool, let's do another workshop, right? Let's do SQL map. And they're like, wow, that's awesome, right? Like, I got all this data back from our apps, mind you, right? So, so let's put them through that workshop. Then we do another workshop on like, okay, so how do I test SOAP, right? Like SOAP UI, you know, proxy through Burp, do that. Uh, okay, now I've got JSON REST APIs. I've got a Postman collection. Okay, let's okay, show you how to do that. You know, Google dorking, doing, you know, how do you find privilege escalation? So I did a whole bunch of workshops, and this went on for months. Probably like three months. You yeah. converted a team yeah. into like vendor project managers that would send emails to into like, like into testers. Into like, test oh, like decent testers. Right, right, good testers. And they loved it, right? Like, I mean, the, so this was not a team that did not want to do this. They were young, and, and, but then they would really wanted to learn this stuff. And, and at this point, you know, we're doing a ton of pen tests and code reviews and static code analysis. So, so really got the team up and running. And, and you know, I can tell you they're, lo they're loving it, and I've got it, like, swapped around where now I've challenged the team, like, okay, you've got to show me something, right? Yeah, I need you to do workshops for and show me something new. And, and so a little bit about my own background, right? I've got a very, very extensive background in software development. I, I started as a software engineer. Um, I was a software architect. I led team of developers. So I'm, I'm used to, I'm very, you know, well versed with development, done a ton of Java development, .NET, what have you. Um, and then I kind of like, you know, I got invited to an OWAS talk. Uh, on Ajax security. I remember we'd just done this big website for Adidas. We did their product catalog, and you know, it was Ajax heavy, and you know, so I gave this talk. Next thing you know, I'm the OWASP, uh, you know, I took over the chapter, <laughs> and, and next thing you know, I'm recruited by, by a consulting company, by Spider Labs, and it was amazing, right? I couldn't believe it. You're doing, you're, you get paid to hack, and you're hacking, you know, ATM machines, card readers, mobile phones, websites. So, so then I went through this extensive period of pen testing. So, so that, so that was, that's a little bit about my own background. I, I currently run the uh, South Florida OWASP chapter. All right, uh, so stop recruiting people to go to OWASP. Yeah, right? they're here, yeah, they're if you're, here. yeah. So three months, really, we, we totally converted the team from people like young, people that weren't, that were sort of technical but not pen testers into kind of the beginnings of a real right. security team. Right? Yeah. And this was last year. And, and so now, like, I think I want to reinforce that this team is now showing me new stuff, right? Like, and it's really awesome. Like, you know, I, this team does workshops and shows me new tools, and, and, and I'm loving it. That, that's really great. Um, and, and so we send our team, you know, so this team really wanted to learn and they were loving what they were doing. We send out one of them to Black Hat. 
A uh, few of us went to APSAC uh, USA last year. That was in San Francisco. They took the SANS training. Uh, you know, so we really invested in our people. You know, th that was a, instead of like in vendors or you know outsourcing, we, we were investing in our own people, making sure they were coming up to speed. So when the you know when the vulnerability started rolling in, because we were doing a huge amount of pen testing at this point, I could you know, and we were having we were talking to the development teams, um, and and you know you're talking about okay, here's a SQL injection, here's cross-site request forgery, or cross-site scripting. I could tell they didn't really understand it, right? Like you talk to the dev teams, and you talk, and they, you know, they'd be like, okay, well, okay, so we'll, you know, you kind of, I could tell they weren't, they, they really didn't understand it. So I, I, you know, in my previous job, I'd done a lot of secure development training for 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 uh, outside companies all over the world. And so what we did was we went on this whole training roadshow, and and you know basically it was a hands-on hacking, you know, where the developers and the QA and the you know architects would get in and they get into this room, uh, go through the training, the OWASP top ten training, you know, use and and then they actually hack, uh, you know, do SQL injection, and then you know I kind of show them SQL map and they're like wow. You know, it's, it's really interesting to see app teams and they're, they're like, wow, hackers have tools too. I'm like, oh yeah, we've got tools just like you guys, right? You've got Eclipse, we've got SQL Map, we've got Padbuster, you know, we've got our own tools. Um, and so, so they loved it. Like I could see they were really excited. Some of these people, and it's really the hands-on lab. So that's kind of what I'm, you know, my experience has been, it's the hands-on nature of this training that's important. Um, and, and, it, and you really get the developers into your, your world. You also find out who your security champions are. The people in that room who are really into it, you can you find out pretty quickly which development team has, you know, who's, who's going to be a security champion in, in that development center. The other thing was to really get to know our development teams, right? Like we want to have a really collaborative, uh, you know, uh, experience with our teams, right? Like we're not like the auditors. You know, we're all doing the same thing. We're trying to protect our apps and, and secure our applications. So it was re it's really nice to get to, you know, it's a ton of traveling, right? I, I think I was at one point I was traveling every other week almost. Uh, but it was absolutely worth it, right? I think the, the, like think about this scenario. When you have the security team would email a vendor and a development team and be like, you guys should talk, we're going to pay. And that was uh, like not even involved. And now all of a sudden we have a security team that's doing their own testing. And then they're talking to the development teams in training. A lot of it was the awareness that we actually have a team now that can do work. Right. right? And, and it was important for them to meet our team, you know, gain confidence in our team that we know what, what we're doing. We're not just going to like tell them, like, go fix it. You know, don't, don't have SQL injection. We can actually have, help them really fix their issues. So that was great, right? It was advertising our team and, um, and, and also getting to know our dev team. So the other thing we did was we adopted Agile. And yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about Agile. So how many people here have heard of Agile or use Agile? Oh yeah, this is like the whole room. All right, cool. So I was a product manager uh, at a job once, and I worked with this guy up here, Matt Conda, who's a big OWASP guy. And we worked together, and that's where I really learned Agile. I have to credit Matt for introducing me to it. And when I started working at this company, I realized, you know, a lot of people would just send emails and they work off email and they didn't, I, I felt like people didn't actually know how to work, right? Like they don't, I don't know, like, oh, I got this email, let me go do that for that person. Oh, I got another email, let me go do that. And they're like, oh, I should go back to the other. People work off their inbox, it seemed like. And so I asked this one guy, I was like, hey, over the next couple months, will you test all these apps for me, like the top important apps, whatever. And then a couple weeks later, or like a month later, I was like, so how'd it go? You know, let me see the results, like what happened? And he's like, well, I got really busy doing all these other things. And I'm like, what other things are you talking about? Like, what are you doing for people? And it's just like random things. You know, when someone asks you to do something, you want to help them. You're like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Like, I'll try, whatever. So I realized, like, we weren't actually doing the things we should be doing. So I decided to get everyone to start using Agile. And we really kind of follow the same methodology as a lot of the development teams. We did two-week sprints and all that. And the goal was really to get the teams to communicate more, like people in the security group to talk every day, like a daily stand-up, 15 minutes, just talk. It was amazing. And then getting kind of the different groups to work between each other, get our arms around all this work coming in and requests for people to do, like, hey, can you do this favor for me? Can you do this thing? Like, I want to understand how much that was, 
right? And then maybe we need to add more people, or maybe we don't need to do that, all right? And just kind of get control of it. So we start it with Agile, which was really interesting. Right, so, so this, so, you know, when I first joined Dunn and Bradstreet, I was actually embedded with our big uh, Hadoop team, you know, so I actually worked with them. And they, they were using Agile in, in a big way. You know, they had two week sprints, uh, you know, they had security stories that were assigned to me and one other person. Um, and I really liked the way that works. So that, it was really easy to adopt that for our team. You know, so, and, and you know, I've really been doing Agile before Agile was around. I was doing extreme programming, you know, which was like the forerunner for Agile way back when I was managing development teams. So that was a natural for me. Um, so yeah, so, so like what John said, we adopted the tools uh, that they were using. You know, they're using Jira, we're using Jira, right? Like we're sending all our vulnerabilities to them through Jira. You know, instead of reports, we're trying to get, you know, just start using Jira. You know, they were on Slack. So guess what, we're on Slack, right? <laughs> We want to be where the developers are. It kind of works for us because we're a distributed team. We've got people in Europe, in Florida, and in New Jersey. The AppSec team is sort of a distributed team. So it kind of works for us. Does anyone use like, the chat, chat off stuff here? Here a little bit, two people? Yeah, I think that's really cool. I don't, I'm like, I want to figure out how we can do it. Seems like a good idea. Yeah, so, so here's kind of what we did. So we created a Jira board. You know, we had the, our, our, one of our, our Jira folks create a Jira board for us. Uh, we set up a backlog, which is all the, you know, testing and other things that we were doing uh, on our team. So we had the uh, backlog. You have a sprint planning meeting at the beginning of every sprint. We pretty much have it Monday morning. Um, and we have two week sprints. So, you know, the spring planning meeting, we look at our backlog and say, okay, which stories are going into the sprint? Right, so we put the stories in, uh, put that into the uh, sprint. Into, into the sprint, we have daily standups, and we've we've gotten really good at our standups. I and mean, we're we're down to like 17 minutes. At six of us, you know, we're we're down to like 15 to 17 minutes. Um, and then we have a retrospectives, which are actually really great, right? Like we talk about what's worked for us, what's not working for us, and what should we start doing. Right, so we have these three columns, and, and everyone's actually very candid in, the, in, you know, in these retrospects. They say, well, you know, that really didn't work, and, and as that, that was not good, and that caused me a lot of issues, and so on. So the retrospectives are actually really great. You know, let us uh, tell us what to do. And then, so I, I'm in a, you know, one of our director's meetings, and John tells me that we have, a, we have Agile in, at DNB, and we have all these Agile coaches. And I was like, awesome, that's great. So we got, uh, so we, you know, talked to them, you know, I was the first one in line to get an Agile coach, because even though we were doing Agile, right, we were doing all the right things, I knew we could do better, because I've done, you know, I've done Agile, I've done Agile even at DNB, and I knew there were things we could improve. So we hired this coach, um, and who's, uh, his name is Jason. And what, what Jason did was, at first, you know, he kind of came in, and he just sort of sat through one of our sprints, two-week sprints. He'd be, he'd attend uh, every, more, every daily stand-up. Uh, he, he attended our sprint planning meeting. He looked at a JIRA board, um, and he then, you know, sat through a retrospective. And, and you know, so, so, so that was really great, because we had some, an outsider looking at how we were working with Agile, which, which was really cool. And I'll talk about the lessons learned from, from, uh, from Jason later. Okay, so automation. So obviously, right, like we, we, we're a small team, thousands of apps, there's only one way to get around it is automation. And, and we knew that. So, you know, and, and this is something I'm starting to call AppSecOps. We wanted to do like sort of continuous monitoring of all of our applications, you know, run scans on an ongoing basis. We wanted to do build integration. We wanted to do automatic reporting, metrics, dashboard. You know, we knew we wanted to do all that. Um, so the first thing we started with was automate with the Zap automation. So one of my team members actually took Zap and created like a Python-based uh, tool around it, automation script that that runs every week now and looks at our entire IP range, finds applications that are running on it because we'll just have applications pop up and we wanted to know about those. You know which one, which ones are showing up, um, and 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 run like an unauthenticated Zap scan on it. So this was like our so foundation for our automation, so our, uh, our ZAP automation. 
Um, and then we are, we're using threat fix. I know there's been a threat fix has been brought up in a couple, of, in a few talks. Uh, and what really threat fix gave us was the whole uh, vulnerability correlation, right? We were doing zap scans, we're doing Rockne scans, we're doing burp scans, we're doing, we're running Fortify, doing static code analysis. We have an external vendor that's doing scanning for us as well for audit requirements. So we're doing a lot of different scans and we needed, we needed to understand that a SQL injection found like in a pen test uh, from like running Zap was the same SQL injection that Fortify found. And, and that's really where we're using ThreadFix for. We also don't have an app sec, uh, application re registry. Like we don't have anywhere where, uh, maybe in some spreadsheet somewhere, which tells us here's all our applications, here's the URLs, here's the point of contacts. You know, we, right. <laughs> yeah, I think Matt's laughing because he's, he's probably there as well, right? Does anyone have that, like a list of all the apps? Like all the apps you and, have. And I mean, we have a pretty large environment, so maybe that's like one of our challenges, but it's like, how do you maintain that? How do you keep it up to date? Like, I don't think even the developers know all the things they have, right? Like, that's one of our challenges, just the scale and the scope of all these things. Right. Um, we needed a dashboard, right? Like, so John's always asking me for metrics, right? Can you tell me how many criticals we have and how long they've been open, right? But a really good question, really. We, we need to understand these things. So we needed a dashboard. We needed to understand what critical vulnerabilities were there, what high vulnerabilities are there, what, you know, what medium vulnerabilities are there, and so on. Um, and then we really needed to do like integrate with Jira, right? Like, so we're integrating ThreadFix with Jira so we can actually vet a vulnerability found by one of our scans uh, and send it to the application Z Jira as an issue. And, and they can let us know when it's remediated. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the maturity of the program. So when I started, I, I realized, you know, I come from the consulting background, so I think about like, uh, here's all the services the security team provides the company, right? And so I wanted a way to measure what we thought the maturity was for all of those, those services. And I looked at CMMI, and I just, I don't know, it just felt broken and old and not, not ideal. So these are like kind of an example of some of the services that we have for like application security, right? And some of them are very mature. Some of them we maybe don't even do, right? And so I wanted a good way to do that. So we came up with the, these categories that we were going to measure across the board, right? And so I use these not just to look at the app security, but all the other all the other security functions as well, right? So there are, we'll talk about some that we look at in AppSec, but there's other broader ones. So the first one we came up with was just like the frequency, like how often do we do it, right? Is it is it ad hoc, we do it once in a while, is it like regularly scheduled? Then the depth, which is kind of subjective, right? A lot of these are fairly subjective, but we needed something to kind of measure. So we're like, you know, do we go very deep? Is it a, just an unauthenticated scan? Is it, you know, full authenticated scan with code, right? And obviously it's different for different apps, depending on the situation. Then we came up with the delivery capability, like how do we actually deliver the service? The coverage, and that's like enterprise-wide, how much do, do we think we've got covered? Um, the process. You know, it's amazing, like, sometimes like there's no process defined, like do we even know what we're doing? And then um, kind of a very subjective like gaps. Like does, do we think like uh, AppSec, like do we have gaps in AppSec? Are they huge, are they small, like what is it, right? And then finally just like the staff coverage, do we think we have enough people to do the work? And it's just a very like rough estimate of where things are. And then we score them like one to four, right? And so. We came up with this, like the scoring, and it's, it's basically like for each of those services, like where do we think we are, right? It's just our own internal measurement. And then what we do is like quarter to quarter look to see, you know, are we progressing, right? So based on that though, within application security, like I, we do that across all the different teams in the whole security program. But in AppSec, we also are starting to roll out Open SAM. So talk about that? Right, so we had a really great one day training with OpenSAM, which is really helpful. Uh, so OpenSAM is a security assurance uh, maturity model. Uh, what it does is it provides you a way to do an assessment of where you are. And, and you know, so Assess Yourself gives very detailed, like a tool, a spreadsheet. 
uh, you know, and, tells, and gives you hints on how to answer those questions. And based on that, you develop a roadmap, right? So you can do like, okay, in one year we want to be here, we want to be like, say, maybe a two plus for training, and we want to be, you know, uh, f uh, you know, for threat assessments, we want to be at two or at one plus, and so on. Um, and so it really, it's, it's really great. And, and you know, I took a look at some of the other ones, like Touchpoints, you know, BSIM, and so on. So OpenSAM really seemed good to me, and, and that's kind of what we're using. How many people are using OpenSAM here? All right, <laughs> this is like half, that's pretty good. Yeah, real good. All right, so another thing that we adopted, and we adopted this like maybe three months ago, is OKR. So those are like objectives and key results. And it's just a very simple way to measure kind of what your goals are. And Google, I think Facebook, there's Google, a bunch yeah. of big companies that use these. So we started to do this in the security team, and it actually got rolled out to all of tech and actually to the whole company. So this was our first quarter using OKRs. And so the idea of an OKR is the objective is something like you want to achieve, very simple, and then you come up with like two or three or four key results how you measure those. And the key results are supposed to be something like numeric that you can calculate. And the idea is you want to score like a seven out of 10 or like 70%, 75%. Your objectives should be kind of like stretch goals, right? If you are 100%, then you know, it's probably too easy. If you're like 50%, you probably is like way too hard, right? And so, um, you know, the, the, the way that they say is you should feel slightly uncomfortable about these, right? So we rolled this out, um, and so we have them an, like for the whole team for a year, like the annual goal, and then quarterly too, and the quarterly kind of break down the annual goals. And so that's really how we track what we're doing. And the idea is that we want something very simple, right? So when we started this, some of the people came up with like 50 objectives, right? And I'm like, this isn't everything you're doing. This isn't your like job here. It's like the three, four things you want to focus on. Right, and so I, I think we're getting better at it. Does anyone here use OKRs? Ah, oh, look at that, zero. They're amazing, well, one, right? All right, cool. All right, so let's talk about metrics a little bit. So KPIs is kind of the key performance indicator. That's basically just a metric, right? I, I think it's the same thing. So we created a bunch of metrics that for each team is like, how do we, you know, how do you want to show how you're doing, right? And just come up with some of the metrics. And, and then we'll just start tracking this. Talk about this one. Okay, so these are a couple of the metrics that we're, tra uh, we're tracking in AppSec, so weighted risk trend. So, we, so this is basically a uh, risk trend. You know, it's, it's basically you multiply your criticals with the, with the, you know, with, with the risk number and, and you add it to your number of highs with the risk, no with the risk number and so on. And you know, so it kind of tells you how you're doing across the application landscape. So this is one we're using, and we kind of know this is going to go up, right? As, as we find more, we do more scanning, we do more testing. This is going to go up for a while. But what we're waiting for the time is when it kind of starts going down, right? Like when we do this, and then it's like, okay, great, now we're there. The other one that's really important is a defect remediation window, right? This is, I mean. We're on the defense side, right? It's not like, okay, CTF, and I'm finding as many criticals as we can. We're really looking to secure our application. So the defect remediation window is very important. It's a time from when you find the, uh, the, the issue to the time it's closed. So that basically it's been fixed, you have verified it, and you've closed it. And, and you'd obviously like that DRW number to go down. Okay, so, so these are some of the, K, uh, the KPIs uh, that we're tracking in AppSec. So the weighted risk trend and DRW I already talked about. Uh, for pen testing, we're kind of looking at the coverage, number of apps that we're testing uh, every month. Uh, architecture review, same thing. That's something we're actually going to start ramping up. There's a training that I'm going to start training. Or we've got a centralized architecture team, maybe set, get them the teach them how to do threat modeling and so on and abuse cases and really like so when they do the architecture they'll you know they'll start doing building security in uh, code reviews and then training and, and that number is not great it's just basically number of classes number of students what are what we really want to know is like after the training did the did the did they actually learn something from the training and did the defects uh, or did they remediate more and did the de number of defects go down yeah, I think, I think our training metric is just number of students is perfect for starting the program right. just to get the awareness. It's more really for the developers to be aware that we're available and we can you know, help out. 
And then as we kind of mature the program, it's really how does the training right. Is it uh, evolve and, and you have people like writing less bugs, right? Okay, so I'll talk about how this piece, all this stuff kind of fits together, right? And I feel like some of the times this is the piece that, that is missing, right? We get so deep into kind of the technical side. So I wanted to have a way to explain what technical vulnerabilities were to my boss and to other people just to, to, so that they understood the risks, right? And so um, I had this meeting, and it was actually a, a lot of tech people, and I told them, I was like, holy shit, do you know we have a beast on our, on our website? We have beasts on the website. I was like, does anyone know what that means? And does anyone here know what that means? The beast on the website? Yeah, all right, hopefully, a couple, right? And so everyone's like, oh my god, we got the beast on the website. I'm like, yeah, I know, it's crazy, right? And then I mentioned like one or two of these other like attacks, and, and they're like, oh my god, that's, that's crazy. And it's like, you have no idea what that means. Like, nobody cares, right? Like, how do we translate like these very technical terms into like something that matters, right? So we came up with this card game because we figured that's probably a better way to, to engage you know, non-tech people. So we have this card game of business goals. And it's amazing when you start talking to business people about their business goals, sometimes they don't have them, right? And so that's why we have a card game. It's like, we will tell you a list of business goals and you can pick a couple. So we come up with these and they're like, you know, grow the revenue, decrease the cost of doing things, whatever. And so we basically make people pick three. Sometimes it's very hard, sometimes people really know. It's great. So like, all right, cool, thanks. Here's your three. So then our team, the security team, maps the business risks that we think um, affect those business goals. So kind of the, the silly example for us, we sell data. So the silly example is uh, our business goal is to sell more data, right? Cool. The business risk is if any of those systems go down, there's like downtime or denial of service or anything like that, that's going to affect the business goal, right? Everyone kind of gets that at a you know, very high level. Like the CEO is like, yeah, that seems to make sense. Website's down, you're not selling more stuff. Sure. Right? So we then come up with this list of the business risks to map to those goals. Right? Then what happens is we take the technical risks identified by all the various security teams, like network security, we have a data security team, app security, and all those technical issues map to one or more business risk. Right? And then we score all of these, right? and then you know, create like a very like heat map or whatever we want to do, dashboard, and use that to talk to the business people about like, hey, this is like your business goals are like in high risk because of these areas, right? These, we've found these things. And then that helps them understand why they should prioritize and kind of push security because they don't know what beast is, right? So here's the quick recap, right? Identify the business goals, map the business risk to those goals, map the technical issues to the business issues, and then uh, basically just kind of report on that, right? generate our risk score. Does anyone do stuff like this? Like, I feel like this is always like a hard part of security is like how do you explain it to non-tech people? And when you're looking at technical risks, how does that like, how is that different than like the risk of like sales not being as high? And like when you think about the business, like you gotta look at all of the, all of the goals and the risks to the business, like security risks are just one aspect, right? I know we all think it's like the most important but you gotta like, how does that fit in? How do you measure those across the whole thing, right? All right, so now we'll just go through the things that we learned, right, through this whole process. So what I just talked about, the kind of the business risk piece, is um, that combined with some public shaming that I'm starting to do with the kind of executive team is helping kind of top down push fixing vulnerabilities Plus, what Rohini is doing, working with the development teams, is kind of the bottom-up approach. So I sent out this um, list of vulnerabilities that have been open for longer than I think they should be to all of the owners. We identified owners and said, hey, you have all these open for a long time. You should talk to Rohini and get these all fixed right away. Pretty soon, this is going to go out as a weekly report to the executive team. And so i um, just giving you a heads up. Right, and so uh, it was amazing how much that yeah. kind of starts driving things works. getting fixed, right? Yeah, instead of my team tracking developers down, they were tracking us, their managers were tracking us down. And like, when can we fix this? 
Okay, yeah, so one other thing, in case you think OKRs are sort of an abstract, sort of like, okay, cool, like something nice to have, but how do you really use it? So we actually use our OKRs, you know, so like John said, we have AppSec OKRs for Q3, and I we were in Dublin on Monday, we had a two-hour meeting with my entire team, um, and we kind of sat through each OKR, we looked at the key result, we basically created epics, you know, put those into epics and created stories out of them. So we actually use, so we, we actually know we're going to get our OKR done because we do this whole quarterly planning thing. And this really came off, this was a suggestion from our uh, Agile coach, Jason, who said, you know what? Dev teams do that, they do release planning. They're, they're like, okay, which features are gonna go into it? That's similar to what we're doing. We, we just call it quarterly planning. So th that, that was a really good lesson learned for us. Um, so one of the agile tips, you know, so, so here's, you know, so like I said, this is, you know, so Jason had like a long meeting with us where we were like, okay, now you've sat through like two weeks with the offers, you know, stand-ups and a red, so what should, what should we do better? The first thing we did was we, rede we redesigned our entire Jira board. So we, we were really not using versions and epics correctly. And there are some big goals that I wanted to track, like how are we doing with automation, right? Automation's a big goal, or, or remediation. And so they became versions uh, on our Jira board. So it was just easier to create a new Jira board. And, and, so th and the reason for that is you actually get Jira reporting for epics and, and versions. You know, so you get things like velocity, like, you know, what's the average number of work you're doing per sprint, and burn down, like, how, how, how are you doing, pr making progress? The other thing we really weren't doing were, we, 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 re we were not using stories correctly, right? We were using more subtasks, so we started using stories, we started using story points, uh, and we were tasking, we were using subtasks already, so we started doing that. We also created a bunch of templates to make our life easy. You know, there's a lot of just pen, you know, pen testing, pen testing, you create a template for that and, and you use it. So, so there were really, you know, some really good lessons learned from, uh, you know, from our Agile coach. The interesting part too, starting to work with these Agile coaches, is in a company like Dun & Bradstreet's very old, and the PMO is Program Management Office, they actually transformed and became an agile coaching organization, which is very different than most kind of PMOs. And so what Rohini got exposed to was kind of interesting is like the religious wars by yeah, agile coaches. Easy. All of you guys know yeah. kind of agile. So it's really funny to kind of see that like debate and the, these guys are out yeah, of control. Like should stories, you know, like should you have tasks that span stories or should you be using story points as numbers? I mean, they get very heated about it. It was very interesting watching that, <laughs> you know. So one thing that, that I think about, and I have a, a guy that I work with who, who makes this comment to me that I think means a lot, is like you can measure every person by just attitude and results. You have to have one, right? And it really kind of, now I think about this all the time, it's like you can have a great attitude and maybe not so great results, that's probably okay. You can have a really shitty attitude and amazing results, that's fine, like I can deal with that. But if you have a shitty attitude and not really good results, like it's not, that's it, right? Like it doesn't work. And so, um, you know, we've, we've actually made a lot of changes to the, the team over the last year. And I kind of just think about this. And I loved how, you know, my friend told me this because it's such a simple way to think about like people, right? And like workers and coworkers and people you depend on is like attitude and results. That's all you have to think about. Like where are they good, right? And I think about it sometimes it's like, oh, we're having trouble with this person who's not really doing a lot of work. And it's like, how, how's their attitude? Are they like, do you want to work with them? Do you like them? And then how's the results, right? So, I don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting. Right, so the other thing that we learned was, um, you know, face-to-face -face interactions are really important, right? Like, so I, like I said, me and my team did a whole bunch of traveling. We traveled, you know, to India and to, you know, Dublin and to, I mean, the good news is at least our dev centers are in good places. So. It's important to travel, and it's, it, you really get those close relationships when you actually meet people face to face. All right, so the other problem we had is that, uh, or the lesson we learned is, as we started advertising security, we started getting a lot of requests from people. So we've got to figure out how to manage all that incoming demand, right? And then we found security, security champions, champions right. like these people in the organization and, that. And, and we found them during the training, mind you. That was during really the great, like how we, you know, we actually saw, saw who our champions were. The other thing we want to do is just keep it simple, right? Like, the more simple, the better. And then also just ourselves knowing, you know, we're yeah. not going to build this mature laser cat program in, like, you know, three yeah. months. It's going to take a while. So <laughs> uh, that's it. That's our story. Thank you.
Yes. The question is, how do you, uh, what do you use to scan production, and how do you make sure it's production safe? So we do a lot of testing in like staging environments, right? right? But then we also do testing in production. I, I, don't, I don't really know, like, so I mean, that's kind of a tricky one. I uh, like to do testing in production, and I have, I, I knock things over occasionally, um, as most pen testers all right, all right. do. Okay, yeah, so, <laughs> so what we do is we've got a two-fold approach. We do the full test in, in a, like an acute environment. And then we've also got our automated ZAP scanner that, uh, that basically does uh, a full unauthenticated pen test of, of our production apps. I kind of feel like if you can knock something over, anyone else could too, right? Yeah, yeah. That's something we should know about. Yes. Oh, yeah. Everything. All oh, yeah. It, it looks for SQL injection, and so say we do find like an app that showed up and has SQL injection, we're all over it. You know that becomes a pretty much a top priority for us. Yes. Have you managed KTLO? Like production. KTLO. Have you managed stuff that comes up in absolute? What's the human element? Oh. So we, okay, so I, I can talk about it from an AppSec perspective. Oh, how do you manage things that randomly come up during, like say you're in the middle of a, of a sprint and, and like new things come up. So what we do is we actually put them in the backlog. We're getting really good about that, you know? But if they are an emergency, you have to prioritize. You know that, okay, this thing, this story may not get done and we push that one in. So there are times you've done that as well. But I guess, do you track them in the Yeah, we tag them in the backlog. So everything basically will go into our backlog. So we'll follow up on it. So when we have a sprint planning meeting, we'll look. We also prioritize our backlog every week. One of our members goes through and say, okay, we, we, you know, the higher ones go on top. So when we do our sprint planning, it's really easy. We look at our backlog. We know what's going to go into the next sprint. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, why did you choose OpenSAM over BSIM? I looked at both, and we actually work with Sigital, and, and you know, we, uh, we've actually done BSIM before, and it didn't work as well in our environment. Uh, and that may not be their fault, actually. But I really liked OpenSAM. Uh, you know, I like the fact that it's prescriptive. <laughs> Here's our OpenSAM uh, trainer. The fact that it's, <laughs> it's, it's prescriptive gives you the prescription to go from like one, you know, one level to your roadmap to another. Say you wanted to get to a level three, you're at a two. Tells you exactly how to get there. And I really like that about OpenSAM. I'm also a little biased for, I'm biased for uh, Prevere. I worked with him in the past and I really like him. So he's one of the key guys for OpenSAM. Do you know Prevere? I think you should really look at OpenSAM. Take a good look at it. It's, it's, really, it's really worthwhile taking a good look at it. And it's free. You can't beat that, right? It's an OWASP project, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.